what was that really easy clustering that was originally just on live CD? What was that called? There was a super dead simple clustering software for Linux for a while. It was only like in the two kernel, two dot something kernel maybe. And uh, you like you boot it off a of Debian live CD and you have a master controller and then you'd boot up all the other ones and say that they should look for the master and then you could you could distribute tasks between all of them. Like the like they had a floating process table. I can't remember. I wonder what it was called. It was the coolest way to do clustered stuff and it was so straightforward. It wouldn't be called Heartbeat, would it? No. It's not around anymore, so it's going to be hard to find because it, it it relied on stuff that was like I think sunsetted a long time ago in the kernel. So it's probably going to it's probably impossible to find it now. It's uh, I'm so old. <laughs> That's the problem. Well, the reason I suggested Heartbeat is because that article is from 2002. <laughs> That's almost old enough. It's not a Beowulf cluster. Um, nice tech map. Yeah, that would play Rust. That would play Rust tech map. That would definitely play. Was it Mozix? Was it Open Mozix? Was that it? I think I just. I think I just found it. Open Mozix. Yeah, and Cluster Nopix. That's the live CD thing I was talking about. So this was originally for from Mozix in two thousand and two. Open Mozix uh, was stable on Linux kernel 2.4.x for the x86 architecture, but porting it to the 2.6 kernel remained in the alpha stage, and support for 64-bit uh, architecture only stayed in the 2.6 version. On July 15, 2007, it was announced the Open Mozix project would, each, would reach end of life due to the decreasing need for SSI clustering and low-cost multi-core processors becoming more available. But so this was particularly useful for running parallel applications. So this is another great way to build. Or it would actually work really well is if I had centralized storage. I had a couple of users that would just slam a Samba server and uh, I could actually move that process around to a system that wasn't as busy. It was really cool. Um, and you could just, when you needed a system, you would just add it to the cluster by booting off of cluster Nopics. It would detect the cluster, and it would just get added as resources, and when you were done, you would reboot it. So at night, I could go reboot a whole bunch of systems into this. Gosh, this is so cool. Oh, man, it was cluster nopics. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, well, it is a Gen 2 derivative. I, uh, I really had fun with that stuff. It'd be really cool to set that up again sometime. Yeah, that does sound fun. For kernel 2.6? Uh, no. And 2.4. Yeah, before my time. 2.4 if you want the good stuff. That's what Nopix in the. This is what the KDE desktop looked like back in the day. Look at that. Is that KDE one or two? I don't know. I don't remember, but I do remember that digital clock. I had all of my KDE desktop set to use that digital clock. You know this clock p- digital. The one thing I'll say about this version of KDE is this panel was rock solid. I have my panel crash on Plasma sometimes now, and this panel never crashed like that. It's probably all just one process or something, but. Uh, Boy, that was a totally different time. Yeah, right? That's funny to think about. Last version was September 1st, 2004. It is possible that you might be able to do it on modern kernels because apparently OpenMozix was forked into Linux PMI and is currently developed. Hmm. OpenMozix Auto Discovery. New nodes automatically join the cluster. Cluster management tools. OpenMozix user land and OpenMozix every node has root access to every other node via SSH. Yeah, that was the other thing I loved about it is they just talked to SSH. MFS DFSA to support every node can have a full blown X or console only for more memory. So what is would you say is still in development? Linux PMI, I think. But Linux PMI, huh? That sounds like something else. The website might Yeah, KDE two. Yeah, I think so. A project with a lot of potential <laughs> oh. from two thousand and nine. Yeah. yeah. A lot of potential. This is Linux Unplugged, episode two hundred and twenty two for November seventh, two thousand and seventeen. Welcome to Linux Unplugged, your weekly Linux talk show that survived Chris's new Rust obsession. And I'm that Chris. Hello. My name is Wes. <laughs> you know, you know, Beard, I kind of blame you because you kind of got me into Rust, so the Beard's here too, but if I'm not here next week, you can blame him. Oh, I you will. You gotta fill in for it's me. It's okay, I'll be here anyway. <laughs> yeah. uh, all right. Yeah, I think he's playing Rust over there right now in the corner. D- despite that, we still managed to put together a pretty good show this week. It's... It's going to be packed with a lot of community news. 
uh, and, a, and a story too. We got a little anecdote uh, that re- that I think resulted in a pretty good app pick this week. A desktop environment we don't often talk about very much, and then StarCraft Two for Linux. Well, we'll we'll explain what's going on there. Dan's here from Elementary OS to tell us what's going on with Granite, which I think is one of the coolest things about Elementary OS, and maybe you'll find out why. And then. There's a spat heard around the community right now, and there's a lot of crazy speculation. Everybody's got conspiracy theories. I'm going to give you a breakdown of what's going on between the Software Freedom Law Center and the Software Freedom Conservancy. A hype-free, conspiracy-free, concise breakdown of what's going on, and the projects that will be impacted by this dispute. Why we actually care. The actual open source projects, the code that you and I all use on our day-to-day adventures, what's actually getting screwed over by all this shenanigans. We'll get into that. And then to make everybody feel better, we're going to wrap it up with one badass looking command line utility that helps you stress the heck out of your Linux box and then visualizes the whole thing for you on the terminal. So yeah, I really like this tool. So we'll talk about that to kind of pick up the mood before we get out of here. But you know, if, if there was ever morale officers to be had, it's those in our virtual lug. Time appropriate greetings, Mumble Room. Hello. Hello. What's good? We will do our best to be guiding you through those morals. <laughs> Thanks. Morales, not morals. Oh, uh, morale. Okay. <laughs> I thought you said moral. What the? We'll, we'll take both. We, actually, we have no morals. You know what? That's true. That's very true. I'll take that. I'll take it. You guys can help us with both. That's probably very useful. So let's get into some interesting news, just to sort of uh, loosen us up a little bit, because there could be ups and downs in this episode. Dramatic moments. Things that no one saw coming. You had one job! But in the meantime, let's talk about Gladys, a Raspberry Pi-powered intelligent open-source home assistant. (sighs) Yeah, okay. So Gladys is new. It's designed from the ground up to act as a central hub that interacts with a variety of smart IoT, that's Internet of Things, devices. You're triggering me over here. I know, I'm sorry. Smart speakers, other devices, light bulbs. But it has a couple other tricks that uh, a lot of your uh, average assistants don't. Glads or Gladys can communicate with low cost 433 megahertz door magnetic contacts and wireless motion sensors through RF 430, 433 megahertz transmitters which and receivers, which I was just thinking, I believe that's the stuff that Noah really likes to. Oh, yeah, right. that's the stuff he likes to install. Um, and of course, as all other kind of fancy things. And they have a they have a demo video where someone has a Bluetooth uh, a Bluetooth low energy switch and they're able to activate a light and music scene by pressing that switch and then talks to the Raspberry Pi 3 and it implements their commands. And you can see they do have um, a GUI that's nice. It's uh, definitely um, for geeks because you put in your, for your home, for your parameters, your home, your address, your city, your postcode, your longitude, your latitude, (laughs) you know, those kinds of things that all average uh, home users setting up today's IoT devices have off the top of their head. I keep them just on my tattoo right here. Yeah, of course you do. Of course you do. And they've got um, bots. That's the one thing I do like about Gladys. Interesting, yeah. If you don't want to do anything else, you can just text it like like a text message. And Gladys Bot will respond to it. I know you're pretty hyped about this, right, Rika? You're probably going to be deploying this. Oh, yeah, totally. 100%. Definitely. (laughs) Okay. All right. Well, I wanted to start with something weird, but apparently nobody gives a shit about it. It's fine. (laughs) You tried. Well, I mean, you didn't bring Noah on the show. He'd love it. Yeah, maybe, because it's talking his 433 megahertz RF. Well, and it's self-hosted. Yeah. Dan, you play with any of these, uh, like, uh, like I got a couple of Echoes. You play with any of these kinds of things, any, like, smart switches and stuff? You know, not really, just because I'm in an apartment, so there's not much modding that I feel comfortable <laughs> doing here. Yeah, I think I think the smart switches are a good way to sort of dip your toe in there. It's useful for me in the winter when it's cold. I know I'm an old man, but I have my heaters on it. It's nice. Mm-hmm. It is nice. I think <laughs> for this, we just really have to see, you know, duh, is there any adoption? Are right. there people doing novel things with right. it that yeah. are passionate about it? Until then, meh. One yeah. of the, the interesting things about this is you can expand it to add additional protocols by adding, like, the Z-Wave USB dongle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, this is, I sort of put this actually in here, a secret. I secretly put it in here to just sort of test to see what the interest was. Because I'm, I'm thinking people are burning out pretty bad on these, is, is what my sense is. And so I wanted to see how that would play out. I, I, I think it is kind of the case. I think it is kind of the I, I think it's, but I, what's interesting is I think it does have some mainstream, broader appeal. Yeah, I think so. It also probably, it probably comes and goes in waves too. You know, people buy a bunch of it, they have it, they get yeah. used to it, and then it's like and you're well, done spending your money for a bit. You're done spending your money, and like 
only so many new types of interactions come online and you know at a certain mm. rate so at some point you're like well i turn all my lights and my heaters off and now the other I'm thing bored. is maybe the people that are buying this are doing it to make stuff easier and so you go with the tools like your echoes and your home assistants and your hues and stuff like that that are all really easy to use because that's why you got it in the first place right and geeks are like we want full-fledged solutions and so it's not a real appealing market to us yeah um have that said, I, I find it to be a nice, I find it to be, and it is actually, now that I say that, one of the reasons I've stuck with it more than more of the automation is because it's had a high degree of family appeal, spousal approvals and children, like That's my important. kids, yeah. like they all get it. They all know how to use it and it works well with that for them, uh, which is one of the reasons why it's stuck. I, hmm. So, okay, maybe something more to our niche then. What do you think about this, guys? Signal is now available as a standalone desktop app. It's an Electron app, but but you can get it on your your Linux or your your Macs or your Windows now. All of them. Yeah, and uh, the setup process is kind of interesting. So you download it. it it's they're shipping as a deb right now, <clears throat> and you can't do jack with it until you have it set up on your mobile device too. And then once you have Signal configured on your mobile device, there's a process in Signal where you add a new device and you scan a QR code and you just tell this app, okay, I've I've set it up on my mobile device, I'm ready now. So it displays the QR code. You scan that with your phone and it links them up. It's pretty similar to Telegram then. Well, no, no. So well, I mean, in that it's useless until you set it up on your mobile device. Yes, yeah. Uh, But what's different than Telegram is it syncs all of your messages and your contacts from the other device not from the server so once it's once you've paired them it then does this moment where it says all right hold on there boss i got to pull down all your contacts and all your messages and sync sync these two things up let me let me ping your device and so instead of having all this stuff sitting on telegram servers that just blast down to a new telegram install this stuff has to sync between your your own encrypted device and before they do that they each set up a key they have a little they have a little chit chat back and forth and negotiate (laughs) and then they and then they do the sync so that was interesting but, um, you know, you're not going to have your, I, ironically, I'd say it's not even nearly as, it doesn't feel nearly as integrated even as Telegram does, which is like some QT app that uses their own thing, their own black magic. I'm, I'm disappointed that they don't have a snap. It only supports distros that use apt. <laughs> That's what they say, yeah. <laughs> Linux distribution supporting apt, like Ubuntu or Debian. Yeah, I bet you it's in the AUR already, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I bet so. <laughs> what do you guys think? Just don't bother them about it when you install it on Arch. Anybody in the mobile room a signal user? Um, are we all just a bunch of Telegram bitches now? Everybody just all a Telegram? Yeah, we are, aren't we? Look at that. Telegram. Nobody's standing. I use signal. You do. Yeah, if you, yeah, I, I do. use it occasionally, too. You do, too. Yeah. All right. Because you can import your MMS messages uh, into it and actually have it as your default texting app on your phone, so you can use it as your messenger. You can only, you know, you can enable extra features for Signal protocol to work its magic. But, yeah, it's just a texting app. I just checked. There are six different Signal AUR. Wow. Entries. So that's why do you use Signal, say, over Telegram? Is it different contacts? Are you separating them out? Is it different features? You know, I don't use it a ton. I, I have way more people on Telegram, so I do use Telegram as my day-to-day. But I have a couple people on Signal, um, and, you know, I do I do have more trust for it and its security too, architecture. Yeah. So when I do have conversations I'd like to keep private, the, that's my choice. Now, Heavens, do you also have any other ones that you could compare it to, or are you just a Signal user? I've used Telegram, too, but not as much. Well, well, Telegram is yeah. more of an app, and Signal is more of a replacement text messenger. Okay, fair enough. That's yeah, fair how enough. I would compare it, sure. really. They both have the same encryption features where you can enable you know, one-to-one communication, but Signal actually replaces the MMS app, which or where Telegram is just a third-party program. Just another app on the phone, yeah. Yeah, it really is. So in that context, <laughs> Signal would be more equivalent to Hangouts, which can do the same thing. Mm-hmm. I wish you, I Close. bet you I Not bet you quite. don't get that that integration on uh, on the Apple iOS on that no. there, uh, Hangouts don't isn't even it's not even that comparable either because Hangouts doesn't exactly replace your MMS app even though it can but it doesn't have integrated encryption into it at least with a protocol which is um vetted it looks like a pretty nice app, and they're steadily adding features. They just recently, at the beginning of October, uh, started beta testing read receipts, which is something that can be nice for some folks. And then at the end of October, we got the desktop app, and uh, now they're working on expanding things like uh, 
doing GIF searches to include in text, you know, the GIFy kind of stuff that people love, all that kind of stuff. So they're they're slowly just checking off features that a lot of other systems have. But what did impress me about it was I really felt it felt it felt more secure than Telegram. It felt like it didn't feel like Vladimir Putin was reading my messages. Yeah, right. When, when tele, every time I'm using Telegram, I go, yeah, yeah, Putin could read this one. And this doesn't seem that exciting, but the, the, the you know the Chrome app version of it, I, I think that was off putting to a lot of people. And so having like real first class. If, if, as long as you're willing to consider Electron real. But regardless, having first-class desktop support, I think, makes it a lot easier for me to make the, the case to others that, hey, you should jump on here. So, man, speaking of uh, <clears throat> Crossover and Chrome, I mean, speaking of Chrome, Crossover has a Chrome OS version. Now, Crossover Office, folks are always hacking away at Wine, and then they, yeah. they make their commercial their commercial version that I've I've almost bought every single version of now because I just think it's it's a nice way to manage your Wine uh, installs, if nothing else. And there's been other things that come along, like gaming on Linux and other things, but nothing's nothing's nearly as good as Crossover. And now they're talking about a version for Chromebooks. This is going to be huge, potentially, if it if it even half works. They have a video. Should we risk it? You want to do a little... Uh, oh, how to install... Oh, this is just how you install Crossover. I do like the music. Yeah, right? Yeah, See, buddy. if Gen 2 Stage 1 had this music, we would be there. Oh yeah, we gotta. We'll, we'll figure that out. Do you think we'd have? Do you think we could figure that out by the end of the show? No, no, not if we're gonna do the whole VM thing. Yeah. Okay. But next time. Yeah. So, anyways, stay tuned for news on that because it's been announced. It's uh, they they have a beta right now. That's the kind. Of, so does that change things for you? No. Does it make a Chromebook any more appealing? No. It, but it does. It does probably make it more appealing for a lot of people. You know how we used to speculate: is the Windows subsystem for Linux going to keep some people on Windows? I know for a fact now it has. I've heard from several Windows users who were considering How switching. You? Yeah. And they were considering switching to Linux and they're like, ah, I don't need to know. I mean, it does make sense, right? If you're just a casual, you don't really care. You haven't bought into the whole open source free software thing. You don't use it. You yeah. haven't so this, realized that. What the pain if this is that move? Have. What if this is that move on Chrome OS? Yeah. Maybe that means only the true Linux users will remain. You, you kind of see the writing on the wall for that, like a mile away. You know? But, you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's probably only going to, I bet you it only works on certain Chromebooks. So, so you got to, okay, yeah, here you go. Here's the requirements. It has to be a Chromebook with an Intel processor. Oh, you have to have Google Play services available and enabled for it. So that probably means a Chromebook that can run Android apps, right? That might be how they're doing this. Oh. Uh, and then 200 megabytes of free disk space and two gigs of RAM. And if you got, if your Chromebook meets those requirements, then you could potentially run Windows applications on your Chromebook. So speaking of messaging applications, does anybody care that Skype has uh, made that Skype for Linux version, that new crazy Skype desktop version? That's now officially the main Skype desktop version. Oh. Yeah, for Mac, for Windows 10. Real official. Windows 8, Windows 7, and Linux are all now switching over to that Electron version of Skype, the one that we've been beta testing um, in the studio. And um, sorry to report, guys, that the feature that I know you all wanted really badly in your Skype. It's been delayed on the desktop version. I hate to break it to you, but Snapchat style stories no. didn't make it to the desktop version of Skype. Man. I know. I know. I know you wanted to have Snapchat like stories in your Skype chat. I really did. Did they manage to port ads? <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> they did. I think they did manage. Yeah, they did what about reliability. <laughs> Because <laughs> I hate that. Yeah, yeah. Microsoft declined to say how many total active Skype users they have today. So TechCrunch speculates that means it's probably still around 300 million. But the company did give some details. Microsoft said that Skype now has surpassed a billion downloads on Android. Jeez. Generated 2 trillion minutes of video calls since 2006. I think half of those were tech snaps. And today's users make up to 3 billion minutes of calls per day. Three billion. You can multiply anything uh, by the number of users you have. It sounds pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny how how much more um, this new version looks like and has the features of Discord and Slack. Yeah, yeah. and Slack. They're, and they've, they're doing bots. They're doing bots too. They're really trying to. Everybody's trying to be. Slack. They've got the reactions. Everybody's trying to be Slack, and it's so annoying. Can't Slack just be Slack? Like, like, at least when Matrix did it, they did something unique there, mm -hmm. you know? But, like, Skype, if you go look at this, we'll have a link in the show notes. You go look at the screenshot in that article, it's what you would almost think it's Slack at first. Maybe someone wrote how to write an Electron app that's like Slack, and then <laughs> there's everyone else is just like, all right, this is easy. Everybody's just looking at the source code to the Slack app and going, 
you know, that's what's great about electron apps. It's all just right here. Let's just take it. <laughs> I don't... It seems like the, the problem is that a lot of times people look at and they go, oh, you know, this is the leading solution. Let's compete with that. Instead yeah. of looking at this is the problem that they tried to solve and that's how they came up with a new competitive product. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you know what I'd like? Here's how I'd like the Skype folks to think about it. Why do people want to use Skype over Slack for video and audio calls? And whatever reasons those are, let's get really even better at those. Mm -hmm. Get even better. Because Slack is adding pretty decent WebRTC video calling. And if if I wanted to just use Slack with that had video calling, I would just use Slack. And so Skype needs to ask the questions to themselves. Why would somebody still choose to use Skype over Slack now that it has those features? Yeah. And double down on that stuff. They're just making, they're just watering down their feature set. And unfortunately, and I hate to be this guy, so typical of me, it really <laughs> it's just so disappointed in myself even, but... We all are, don't worry. And, and you, 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 you have to back me up on this because you witnessed it firsthand. We have legitimately had considerably better audio and video performance under the old Windows version than we have with the new Skype beta version. Yeah, that's true. It pains me to say it, but you're right. Like, we tried for weeks to get video working properly in a way that didn't suck on TechSnap, and and then we eventually just, for on a whim, like, well, let's reboot into Windows 7 and use the old version of Skype. See what happens. And it was bulletproof ever since. And it sounds better, too. And that's really the... That just pisses me off, man. Yeah. I wonder now, I don't... I, I wonder which version Dan was using. Like, I wonder if it's any better, if it's the mm. modern Electron mm-hmm. on both ends. Yeah. God. Probably not. It is, I do find it to be better. So on Coda Radio, if both my, Mike and I are on the Electron version, mm-hmm. it's better. And if he's on like a, a non-Electron version, I have to reboot into an OS that has the non-Electron oh, okay. version. Interesting. And then it sounds better. And it works better. The two do not still, I don't think, work as well together. And I'm just, you know, just listening to with my ears recording these shows. I Maybe other people are getting different results. But for the, my, my the work. broadcaster bad ears of yours? Well, my kids scream in them a lot. So they're not as good as they <laughs> used to be. All right. Let's talk about a desktop environment that doesn't get... As somebody put it, enough love on this show recently, and that's Enlightenment. Enlightenment has a brand new release, 22. How about that? Did you even know? Did you even know after one year and 1,500 patches, 200 tickets on their issue tracker, and a whole bunch of new features, we get Enlightenment 22, and one of the headline features is greatly improved Waylon support. Adding support for all kinds of stuff, including some of the pointer stuff that was really broken and improved support for X-Wayland as well. Which is kind of- Enlightenment was one of the first desktops to actually implement Wayland protocol support because of their compositor design. They but have- I imagine that they had to have as well, update their Wayland sure. protocol yeah. support mm-hmm. in order to get up to date, but they were one of the first. Yep. Yep, they 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 definitely were, and they they just had they just had to get they had to get caught up essentially. Uh, they've made some improvements to how their windows tile, and uh, they have per window now pulse I audio. I saw that. That looks pretty nice. Right there in the so you have your title bar where you have your application icon. You have in the middle of the window you have the the name of the app, and then you have your window controls like your maximize, your minimize, and your close on the far right. But on the far left, next to like the little icon, they put volume control for that specific application. If that's not, if that's not wow. the most brilliant thing I've ever seen, it brings a tear to me. I'm so you're saying uh, Enlightenment 22. That's what's going you on the studio right. machine. Reloading Boom. all these systems. Reloading all these systems. It does actually make me want to try it next to go. I don't know if it would work in next to go, but it, if it if it did, it would that would be pretty great. And they've also worked. I I remember their gadgets were really cool. They've been on, they've improved the gadget infrastructure, as they put it, and they've also created a improved GUI for uh, like pseudo prompts and SSH password prompts That's and things nice. like that. Little things, little I usability. Obviously, things. I'm not a, I'm not a daily user, so I can't speak authoritatively on it. But uh, I'm gonna be I'm gonna admit I'm a little enlightenment curious. Yeah, I am as well. Maybe I can install it on Gentoo later. Yeah, if you ever get that Gentoo working, Wes. I'm sorry. Just one job. Just one. You know what, Wes? Just, just. You had one job! Noah, Noah couldn't have said it better myself. Noah it's okay. Couldn't. The EFL is way faster to compile than the GNOME or KDE <laughs> libraries. I believe. Yeah, no kidding. That'd actually be a shortcut when you huh. get to that stage. You should do that. Yeah, right on. Why not? Yeah. All right. Well, let's let's keep going here. I got a I got an app pick, as it were, uh, based off of a little support call I, I wound up in 
before the show. So I thought, why not share it with the yeah. uh, with the whole class? You're so generous. Speaking of class, linuxacademy.com slash unplugged. Go there and sign up for a free seven-day trial. It's a platform to learn all about Linux, really any DevOps topic, and then any of those huge platforms around Linux, like like OpenStack or, or AWS or Azure. There was just a big OpenStack summit. And... Um, Lots of news. I almost put some of it in the show, but I figure if people are OpenStack curious, they could just go to Linux Academy. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. You support the show. You sign up for a free seven-day trial. They have a great system with hands-on scenario-based labs. They have instructors, real humans that can help you. They have a course scheduler when you're busy. Learning paths, which are a series of courses and content planned by instructors. And then they have a community that's full of your fellow Jupiter Broadcasting listeners because they've been a sponsor for quite a while. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplug. It's a great platform that's always getting better. They're always adding new value, adding new content, fixing up and improving and going back and rephrasing based on feedback or addending things based on new commands. It's, it's a great system. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplug. Go there, sign up, free seven-day trial you get a sense of the system. Also, enjoy the offline content. You can download and take some study guides with you. They have Android and iOS apps to listen and study on the go. An audio that you can kind of take in like an audio book. It's a pretty nice system. LinuxAcademy.com slash unplugged. You might say they paint a great picture in your mind. They do. And speaking of painting a great picture, the lady, my lady, my lady friend, came to me last night and said, uh, I tasked one of my employees, her name's Christina, with uh, setting up uh, an image editor on our uh, front uh, our front workstation. Okay. Now, Christina is a lifelong Windows user, and the front workstation is an Ubuntu 16.04 system with Unity 7 on it. And I immediately, my heart sunk, because I'm like, oh, God, how could this have possibly gone? Because what is she going to do? First, she's going to go to Google, and best case scenario, and no disrespect to the game project, but best case scenario is she somehow... After all of her research online, because this guy loves to research, she's very diligent, mm. she winds up at GIMP, somehow figures out how to get GIMP installed on the Ubuntu box, and then they go to just, they want to create some signage, because they, mar- they have a marketing thing coming up, and they need some digital billboards, they just need to mock together some signs for it, to show the artist what they want. That's all they're looking for. And so I'm thinking, I'm thinking paint would do the job, right? And of course, as luck would have it, they wound up at GIMP, and they got GIMP installed to okay. their credit, which... Yep. Good work, I team. I yeah. wish I could have had like a camera on that to see how all that went down. Um, the guy, Do you have like a Linux badge they can give them? Just like a good job. You've installed GIMP. That's a right up I actually was very impressed. So they got that installed and then they opened it. And that's where it didn't work out. And they're like, whoa. And it's funny. You know what their first reaction was? And it, it was so classic. It couldn't have been more classic because I had no influence on this conversation. Well, this is nothing like Photoshop. <laughs> <laughs> Kaboom! I'm like, oh, damn it, damn it. I'm like, come on, come on. Okay, well. And have you heard of Gimp Shop? So, I, Just yeah. The skin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought about it. I did. But, you know, there's another app. I've mentioned it once before on the air, and I, I think it was years ago in, on, in the Linux Action Show, and it's just such a great basic app. And it's, it's, it's Pinta, P-I-N-T-A, and it's painting made simple. And they have a PPA available for Ubuntu, so... At first, I had to try to install it through the software center, but it wasn't working for. So, uh, you, know, you know what? You know what is always the easiest is just give people commands. Have them open the terminal. It's just it's 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 binary. They type it in, and it either works or it doesn't work. And there's no like, what are you seeing on your screen? Oh, yeah, right. Uh, where is that button at? Like, it's just trying to you... describe where the menu and yeah, mm-hmm. right. Did the prompt come back or did the prompt not come back? That's all I have to know. And so I I was able to, with three commands. She got the PPA set up. We got a repos update, and then she got it installed. And they are up and working with with Pinta P I N T A. It's a free open source program for drawing and image editing, and it's it's just powerful enough. It's more powerful. It's more like a Paint.net. If you ever use Paint.net oh, on yeah. Windows, mm-hmm. uh, I used to use that, and it's more like Paint.net. It's got layer support. It's got histories. It's got tabs. It's got lots of basic image editing, um, and it's just it's just really simple. Does it, it works. come with the cute dog picture? Because <laughs> I don't think so. If, uh, if you're looking for something simple as well, I'd also give a shout out to uh, My Paint. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah, my paint's my also paint. really good. Right. That was the other one that I I, had, I knew there was another one I was forgetting. My paint is also one I like. 
So mypaint.org is where you can find that one. And then, yeah, GIMP Shop, as Heaven mentioned, is if you just want to use GIMP, but just have it arranged in a way that makes it look more like Photoshop, which is something I've enjoyed because I had used Photoshop previously because my mom was a graphic artist. And so she's been using Photoshop literally since version one. And so it was always in our household. Yeah. So I grew up with, from version one, and then I stopped using Photoshop heavily around seven, but I still use it on and off frequently. Uh, with our we, JB has a Creative Cloud subscription, and I still find it to be a better layout than GIMP. I probably, you know, I'm probably equal in my usage there. Mm-hmm. And so, if I could just make GIMP look more like Photoshop, I think I'm going to do it again. I think I'm going to try to GIMP shop it up again. I used to do it. I think I'm going to do it again. And then, I'm on Unity. I'm going to GIMP shop it up. I'm going all in, guys. If, <laughs> oh yeah, because a lot of people that know Photoshop know that Photoshop has plenty of obscure features that but they would probably yes, never know of right. for years, totally. other, unless they were ex- an expert. And so they expect new features to pop up, and GIMP Shop does give them that experience of discovery. <laughs> and if you want something else that's advanced that's not the GIMP, then there's also uh, Krita. Yeah, which I think is maybe yeah, more for good. drawing, but yeah. yeah. I know that Albert likes Krita a lot. So there, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of hubbub today about this um, StarCraft that came out for Linux StarCraft 2. I mean, get me started on that. Yeah, it's it's just a headless thing. It's a headless thing, but it kind of it might be a cool way to run like uh, the StarCraft server remotely on a Linux box somewhere. Is it, it is that be. what I'm getting here? Well, that's what I'm aware of. It's the protocols. So as long as the protocols are um, network capable yeah. Yeah. and not just local network capable, then you should be able to run a StarCraft client on a remote server and have it relay all of the commands back and just play locally. People so, yeah, seem pretty excited about Digital, low po- digital yeah, ocean right. droplets right. of StarCraft. <laughs> now we just need somebody to write an open source front end right. to talk to that. I know. Yeah, can you play StarCraft 2 on Linux? I've never tried. So. I don't know. And under Wine, yeah. Oh, you can? You can. Uh, hashtag Rust Life. I don't know. All I know is Rust. I've been, every free minute I log into Rust. There's a StarCraft 2 Arch Wiki entry, so that says something. I'll save it for user error. Oh, yeah. We're, we're going to have to talk about Rust on user error this week because I had such a hoot with Wimpy and Popey last week. They got me. They sucked me in, and I came in at the right time, and it's it's been a blast. So check out this. The check out user error later this week for, for the, I got, a, I got a story. Also, Popey, if you're listening to this, I think you might be a psychopath. Sorry. All right, moving on. We got a question that came into You're the right show. Right <laughs> Don't focus on that. Uh, wh- can we what? go back for just a second? Sure, sure. Yeah, I'm looking at the the downloads for the StarCraft Two yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's password. It's in a password protected file, and the password is "I agree to the EULA." Yeah. Nice. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Boy. Yeah. I That's looked around too for licensing stuff, and it was pretty. I don't know. People are pretty jacked up about it. And I looked at it and I'm going, okay. Looks like under wine, it's platinum though. It so is that's pretty good. Oh, so the game is. Yeah. Oh, it is apparently under the AI and machine learning license. Well, now I know where all my hard work, hard earned money is going, which no, is a Blizzard specific license. I tell you. <laughs> okay. I tell you, if you boy, if you want to, if you want to try out a few life theories, like. Should I have been a member of the collective? Should I've gone out on my own? Could I live after the collapse? You should play Rust, Eric. It's a, it's a good it's just a good mental exercise. You can just try out a few different life scenarios. All right, so we got a question that came into the show, and maybe Dan might help us with this one because um, I bet he has thoughts. I bet so. He says, guys, uh, what distro should I be using to get high DPI support on my laptop? I recently bought a Dell XPS 15, and I've been having a hard time finding a distribution that doesn't look like crap on my high DPI display. Anything uh, running XFCE. <laughs> <laughs> Not that. The True. Opposite. What do you think, though, Dan? Because uh, I know high DPI is something that the elementary project has some opinions on. And I I recall one of my first out-of-the-box high DPI just working by default distros was elementary OS. So I'm going to put that down for you as a recommendation. But high DPI thoughts in general, is there things to look out for or things he, he can look for? Yeah, I mean, high DPI is pretty complicated right now, actually. And um, I think the the first big question to ask is, are you going to be using this with an external display? Because if you are, then you definitely want a distro that's running Wayland. Because mixing DPIs um, is not something that X does well. Definitely. That is, you'll get the uh, weakest link in the chain, basically, on that external monitor, and it's a bummer. It's, yeah. 
Yeah. Then the next question after that is um, what scaling does your display attempt to do normally? Because Windows does uh, non-integer scaling. And so a lot of these manufacturers are putting out displays that are built for non-integer scaling. Whereas um, most high DPI ready desktop environments in the Linux space right now only handle integer scaling. Wow. I barely even understand. Is that right? The fractional scaling. Yeah, that's where it. Yeah. That's yeah, so so if your display is looking for like a 1.25 or 1.5 scale, like you're going to have a pretty pretty bad time. Right. Um right. unless like Unity has some stuff for that, like the latest GNOME added some stuff for that, but that's still like you still probably want to be on Wayland for that. And you're talking so, like the really latest version of GNOME. Yeah. yeah. So if you get past those two things and you're like, oh, I'm only going to do integer scaling on my laptop and I'm not going to attach to an external display, then you can pretty much go with anything that's GTK3. Yeah. Uh, I, ha- I will say I have pretty good success with elementary OS and I have great success with Unity 7. You have to go manually do it in Unity 7. Like an animal. <laughs> I have to squint at my screen and I... That's where I, you have the magnifying glass in your, in your desk drawer. Right. Just for that. But the nice thing is, is you just hit the super key, you type in display, enter, and then it's the only slider on that window is the one you need to move and you just slide it up to like a two in my case and mm-hmm. looking good. Uh, and I bet that's the case for the XPS 15, too. I bet it'd just be a 2. Um, remember, for them, they have to remember that it's the dis- or desktop environment that does the DPI scaling, not the distro. Right. right. Yeah, that's right. important. Yes, yes. Yeah, the question what did say distro, didn't it? It did. So you could, yeah, you yeah, you really need to focus more on the desktop environment. So the latest gnomes, Plasma can do this, too, uh, and elementary. And, and uh, you know, I'm going to be that guy. I'm going to say Unity 7, too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. You didn't seven. You got to kind of stick to that stuff for right now. And if anybody has any other tips, uh, please leave a comment. Let us know. So Dan, the real, the really tough stuff about that though is um, you're going to run into like apps like Steam that don't scale, oh, or it's like horrible OBS, yeah. or like a lot of the really important apps that you're going to want <laughs> don't support IDPI yep. yet. Yeah, you know, surprisingly, my daily driver at home, I've wound up on a high DPI display and uh, not didn't even really, just that's the laptop I ended up taking home for a bit. And uh, that's really where it stands out the most is Steam. Otherwise, it's pretty good. Like my day-to-day apps that I use, Chrome and Firefox and the terminal and uh, my editors, they all look really good now. So it's it's those things like Steam or it's old X applications that or like an old Java app or something that just look like real hell. Yeah. Or sometimes like some c- proprietary stuff like the, the Dropbox UI doesn't look quite right, but it essentially looks right. And Telegram has support. You can go in there and you can tell Telegram to zoom its UI up a little bit and then it looks, then Telegram looks fine too. Um, so good luck. So Dan, while we're chatting, why don't we talk a little bit about the new release of Granite and uh, um, what's new there? And, and maybe... I know we've talked before, maybe even on this show about it, maybe not, but kind of like a re- quick recap of what the heck Granite even is. Yeah, so if you're not familiar with what Granite is, um, basically we we had this problem when we started out where we were making a lot of apps with not a lot of people and realizing that we had a lot of common design patterns that we were spending a lot of time rewriting over and over and over again. So we made this library on Granite, and it's a companion library for uh, GTK Plus and GLive. And Granite basically is just a way for us to not repeat ourselves. It contains like common um, utilities and widgets and design patterns that we've used all in our different apps that you can use in your apps too. And it makes it really easy to write nice uh, elementary HIG compliant apps very quickly. And so this has got to, I got to imagine, helped with the uh, App Store adoption that we talked, App Center adoption we talked about last week. Over 50 native applications. I mean, a lot of them, are, or maybe all of them, using Granite to, to get set up? I don't know if all of them are, but but I'm sure like a fair number yeah. of them are. I don't have that stat actually handy. Sure. But uh, I can tell you that we're over 60 apps now. Hey, oh, congrats. That's nice. awesome. Thanks. I think this is, I think the the reason why I've always praised this is because it's, a, it's the easy button for developers. Yeah, it's it just it does a lot of the hard work that they don't really want to do yeah, anyway. I'm like, okay, maybe I could learn how to do this. Right, and the thing is, is like it takes care of UI elements that you don't have to worry about, and by using these, it looks consistent and well integrated with the rest of the entire app, uh, uh, operating system, and so it looks like it's part of an ecosystem. So, 
I really, I really think that every distribution should have this. I think Canonical would have had this with Unity 8 once they were done. Um, I think GNOME started to go in this direction with GNOME Builder. They started down this path, but there's a, there's there's so much work to be done here. And now we have a, a, an iterate, another iterative release. It's the 0.5 release of Granite. What's what's new? What's what do you, what lessons have you guys learned recently that's been sort of integrated into this release? So there's a there's a couple big things in this release. One of them was um, not only what's new, but what we got rid of. Um, there's a ton of stuff that uh, we built out in Granite that is now um, available in GTK or has become features at GTK. So we're able to pull out a bunch of stuff and make it way leaner code based. Um, but we also went in and we redid the whole demo app. So it's way easier to find out like, hey, what utilities and widgets are actually supplied by Granite. And then uh, we have some new utilities for date time. So we have a, um, a new relative date time utility. So you can give uh, this utility um, a time and then it'll say, oh, that time, it'll give you a natural language string back. Like, oh, that's in five minutes. That's in three hours. That was yesterday. That was last week. You know, it, it'll give you like a natural language response you can use in like your messaging app or, or scheduling or things like that. <laughs> nice. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I'm going through the post right now. It just looks looks so clean. I really like this demo app because as a as as somebody who's maybe not familiar with what what all Granite does bring, you can just sit down here and basically tab through this application and see all the different stuff that it brings. And it's it, the range is is pretty big actually. It's quite a bit of quite a quite a lot of stuff. Do you I guess so this is 0.5 and I'm sure you're mm -hmm. not going to want to speculate about the future, but Am I going to someday see things on here like maybe like some sort of cloud related service on this tab or some kind of something that's unique to elementary OS like a like what other things do you think down the road could be added to the sidebar of options that Granite lets you integrate with your application? Um I mean I guess the scope of Granite is pretty big um because it is just like whatever common widgets and utilities are in there. Uh, one of the one of the next widgets that I want to get in there is um, we built this uh, sharing menu for oh. um, App Center, so you can share links to apps in App Center. And so I really want to build that into a proper Granite widget with a great API, so that you can just say like, "Hey, I've got a string that's this many characters, and it has a link, and it's an image." And then the popover will figure out like, "Oh, like these are the social networks that accept all those parameters." And then uh -huh. you know, like that's one widget I really want to get in there. Very cool. I like that. Yeah, this is uh, this is a nice write up with uh, with great p pretty pictures too, and I have it linked in the show notes if you guys want to check it out. And uh, I. I would think it's gotta it's gotta help lead to the success of those sixty apps. The fact that they're actually there. I mean, if you, if you stop and think about the the hard work, a lot of times on Linux is getting the UI right for developers. A lot of times we have a lot of really great applications, and the UI is just a little rough. Well, and like it seems like that's kind of sometimes the barrier too. Like, okay, well, I know how to make all the back end work, but to make it usable to you, I need to have like not, it doesn't even have to be beautiful, but I just need a usable UI. So if this can make that. Trivial. That's awesome. Yeah, and it's not uh, it's not Electron. Right. See, that's the thing. Like, that's the that would mean like, okay, well, if I can just integrate this with whatever else I was doing, and I don't have to jump to the Electron bandwagon. Yeah. I mean, at the, the end better. of the day, these are. I mean, correct, Dan. At the end of the day, these are essentially GTK applications that are being produced. Yeah, it's all it's all GTK three, and and yeah, Granite uses GTK behind the scenes, so it, it's they're all just GTK widgets that are kind of prefab. Yeah. And and one of the things that's super awesome, I think, is that we've been able to get a, a developer ecosystem that's excited about GTK CSS and providing like easy style classes for them to use. You'll see like a ton of the apps in App Center have um, nice brand colors and they do interesting things with GTK CSS to, to, to look really nice. Mm -hmm. Well, great work and uh, nice post too. Good job on the write up. It was a good read. So thank you very much. I thank appreciate you. you coming on and explaining that. It's nice to and pick your brain on that. Go ahead. Oh, Granite is built upon Vala, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Okay, and Vala is built upon GTK, so it might be an indirect, but that's why it's built upon GTK. But Vala really gives you a lot of power when it comes to scripting and its ease of use, doesn't it? Yeah, it's built It's built purpose-built for G-Object, so it feels really native to write GTK with Vala. Hmm. That's what I've heard, and it, I have looked into it before, but... I haven't bothered with it. You should give it another chance. Uh, if you're familiar with C Sharp, um, then you'll be able to jump into it super easy. Like the syntax is buttery smooth. It's way easier than trying to write GTK with like C. 
Oh yes, G object. Well, <laughs> raw G object is brutal. Makes my eyes bleed. <laughs> I I uh, every time we talk Vala, there's always some hater that comes along and talks bad about it. But every time I hear about it, it sounds like it sounds like a great way to go. And it is a good intermediary. Yeah, exactly. And it's, 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 I mean, the proof seems to be in the pudding more and more. There's some great apps. And we, we've been talking about apps in the App Center, but, of course, Elementary OS ships just with a bunch of great apps that are built around this and Vala already installed out of the, out of the ISO. Uh, so it's not just the things in the App Center. It's also the apps that have been getting shipped on and revved on now for years. Yeah, and the whole uh, DE, too. Our desktop environment is all GTK3 and, and Vala. I think I think we use more GTK in our desktop environment than GNOME does these days. <laughs> I uh, now wow. that I'm back on the 1604 bandwagon like never before, I should uh, I should give it another go, Dan. I should really take another look because damn, if it doesn't all just look super appealing all the time, I like it, and I'm liking 1604 a lot. It can, am I allowed to talk about that? Is that okay? Can I can I uh, allowed to talk about? Well, so last week I I admitted that. Uh, after the whole 1710 excitement was over, I ended up going back to Ubuntu 16.04 and then realizing that Unity 7 was actually pretty great for my particular use case. And then, like a madman, proceeded to just wipe all my systems and put Ubuntu <laughs> and uh, Unity 7 with the exception of the OBS machine just because of the capture cards. Uh, and I'm all in. And it's I'm, uh, I'm loving it. And I, I, I think it's the new XFCE. Mm-hmm. And... Um, I thought I would get a truckload of shit for saying that last week. I was really expecting people to harp on me. And I got a ton of people saying they were doing the same thing and that they agreed. Really? Yeah. Way more than I expected. Wow. Yeah. On, on all, the, all the feedback mechanisms, it was really um, surprising to me. It was like when I admitted that I like Nano more than Vim. I know Vim and I keep my Vim skills active. But if I'm if I'm choosing, I just prefer I prefer Nano. I like the bottom area of Nano where it just lays out the commands for me. Gotta hate that. I know. Not that it prints it, it just, just that I don't know how to use it. Oh, Nano. Yeah, and then of course, and me, I'm, I'm a Nano Tech W. That's I'm a Nano Tech W guy, and I've been rocking that now for. You know, everybody always says, "Here's the bullshit." Here's the bullshit Emacs Vim propaganda that you get fed as a sysadmin is every every server you log into is always gonna have VI. So you just learn VI. Well, you know what? That's not true. Every server has Vim, first of all. Second of all, second of all, it, it I, I have yet to meet a system that doesn't have like Nano or Pico or or Joe or some other non-Vim editor. I, I just I don't I don't work on those systems. I know there's systems out there. I understand that. I don't work on those systems. <laughs> sure. And so I've always had Nano. I've always enjoyed it. I've always thought it's been pretty great. And so one day on the show, I finally came out and I said. I like Nano, and I'm a Nano user. And I got a ton of people that said, I also like Nano. And I'm not saying Vim's bad, or Emacs. And now I'm saying this with Unity. I like Unity, and I think it's pretty good. And I'm going to use it for a while. And I thought, I thought it'd be the same thing. I'd get flamed. A ton of people came back. A ton of, ton of people came. Joe Collins made a YouTube video about it on his YouTube channel about how he's going to Unity. Nice, yeah. He's sticking with 16.04 and Unity. There's something about the LTS releases is when you when you... When you become an LTS user, Wes, you realize that all the other releases are just beta tests for the LTS. And they can call it 1710, but it really should be called 1804 beta. Yeah, there you Where's that ding soundboard effect? <laughs> Boom! <laughs> oh, man, I don't know what's happened to me. I feel like, I feel like I've had some sort of like a psychedelic Linux experience, and I've come out on the other side of it as a changed man. Is what happened to me. You'll be back well, on the Arch Drug in six months. <laughs> you know, yeah, maybe Nano is just a Vim clone. Unity, there's one gripe that I cannot accept. That, that a lot of its desktop functionality is implemented in Python. And that's against my morals. Yeah, I can, you know, I can see it. I can see switching for moral reasons. And I tell you what, if, if, if I felt like that ever caused it to be slow or pokey or crashy, I'd probably bail. But so far... Yeah, you wouldn't care what was making it slow yeah, or so crashy. Awesome. You'd just get out of there. Oh, yeah. The old XFCE menu. It was based on Python. No, it wasn't the XFCE menu. It was that desktop that was recently implemented in C, but it wasn't Python before. Goodness gracious. Does, does anyone remember? No. 
God. Okay. Anyway, the, are you I, talking about it might have been the budgie. It might have been the budgie menu. I don't... Yeah, it used to be oh, the okay. mint menu. Okay. Mint menu was based on Python. They re-implemented it in C, and it was way faster. Sure. I think budgie's Unity. been written in every language. <laughs> yeah, that's the same. Well, that's you got to find thing the with Unity local minimum, and then you. you I can only out. hope Unity goes down in flames, but I like Nano. You know, it, yeah. as long as it's all small batch, organically sourced, one hundred percent locally produced code. I'm okay with that. I would like to try Unity and the new GNOME with the Ubuntu shell yeah. on the same system. I haven't done yeah. that yet. And like, Do a little A, B skis? Yes. Because hmm. that's, I, I used Unity at work all the time. I'm kind of thinking like, okay, I wonder, maybe I should try the, try, try the new version out, see what that looks like. I feel like Unity's faster, having ran it on some of the same systems. But mm -hmm. uh, then again, what do I know? What do you? What the hell do I know? I don't know. You know there's something about the fact that my dock isn't some extension. QML, JavaScript. You know, it's the quick. Like that dock here in Unity, I don't know. It just feels really solid. It doesn't ever flicker. It doesn't ever. You saying you want to flicker in Unity plugin? So I've just been on the GNOME desktop long enough where my dock's just totally taken a shit and it's gone away. <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, so. Right. Okay. So I don't have that anymore. And then, oh, and then what it was is, of course, it was, well, GNOME updated. And the dock that I had installed was from the repo, but the repo package for the dock extension hadn't been updated yet so i updated the gnome desktop <laughs> with the extension so then i had to uninstall the distros version of the yeah. extent of the yeah. of that extension then go to then then go then go to the gnome extensions website and install the extension separately see if you just don't install the doc extension then that's pretty all right but i yeah. take your point I find it particularly useful to just have my sets of icons right there. I don't, you know, I'm not a big dock guy. It doesn't have to, it can be a bar. It doesn't have to be a dock. I don't care what you call <laughs> yeah. it. Just call it whatever you want. The icons just, don't have to get bigger when you hover on them. Microsoft got it right in Windows 7 when they added the quick launch down there at yeah. the bottom. They got it right. And uh, I, uh, ever since that, I, I, I essentially try to get that. And I just want, I want my, my launcher and my searcher, and I want my quick launch icons. And, um... That's what I go for. And Unity 7 does a pretty good job with that in a way that doesn't make me feel like I'm using Windows at all, but still gives me that <laughs> same kind of functionality. So it doesn't really make me think about it. That's what I like. Because that's the problem with Mate and both with XFCE is I, I'm like, I'm like using Windows over here. I'm using Windows again. DigitalOcean.com. Go over there and create an account and then use our promo code DO Unplugged. You get a $10 credit. And, and with that $10 credit, you could try their uh, object storage for two months for free so you can stack them. And I don't know what, maybe Bill's some sort of media empire in like two months because with DigitalOcean you got their fast connection you got their dashboard for days you can deploy in seconds everything's SSDs and you can choose the distro that best suits you or even Alan Jude's free BSD and for me besides the object storage the block storage is is just great it's been around for a while and what I love about it is it, it shows up to the operating system as if it was just a block device so you can look in dmessage you'll see it show up there and then you can go into FS tab and you can actually just mount it to a folder on your file system and it's just like dev so slash. So can we install Gentoo on that thing? Is that our solution? <sighs> boom, boom. You know, I'm thinking maybe you're not up for this challenge anymore. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. Maybe. You're the one that's supposed to be looking into that right now. That's true. That's aren't true. you? Google that for us. Okay, back to DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean's also got monitoring and alerting and they have team support, which is really great. And then they got private networking which is fantastic because it doesn't count against your transfer when you use that private network. And that's great for like proxies or if you got a database or a backup server, which I should probably do that. I should probably do that. I've got a new DigitalOcean droplet that uh, has some pretty important data on there. So why even put that out on the public net? Just put, put it on the private one and then just let my droplets talk to each other. DigitalOcean.com, use our promo code Unplugged. create the account, apply that, Get the $10 credit. And then you're off to the races. DigitalOcean.com, promo code DO Unplugged. Yeah, I wonder if you could. Do you think you could, uh, you think you could get that, you think you could get that Gen 2 working on a droplet? I'll, I'll give it a shot. That's you for sure. You think you could do that? Yeah. That would be pretty interesting. I would say it'd be interesting to try it. I was thinking a VM, but a droplet would be pretty dang cool. It'd be pretty cool. Okay, so there is a story that we're going uh, there. We're going to go to. And I want to be really careful because this thing is going to have big ramifications and it's one of these stories that is very easily turned into clickbait. And it's very easily going to, it's going to be, it'd be, it'd be simple to set the tone of the conversation in the wrong direction on this particular story. And I think it's too important of a story for that. But I also 
I don't want to ignore important things that are going on just because I'm afraid of screwing up the discussion. <clears throat> so we're going to start with what's going on between the Software Freedom Law Center and the Software Freedom Conservancy. Two separate projects. I'm going to refer to them as Law Center and Conservancy just to try to... <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good idea. Yeah. The background between these two organizations is they... Uh, they, well, by all public appearances, seem to be uh, two cooperative organizations. In fact, the Law Center helped establish the conservancy early on, was involved with that process and provided counsel. So they've been working, they had publicly appeared to be working in tandem for quite some time. Um, I don't know exactly about the people running the two different organizations, if they were working in tandem necessarily, but we'll get to that perhaps. On September 21st, 2017, Eben Moglen on the Software Freedom Law Center's blog posted a rather long post that addressed IRS service changes now under the Trump administration versus the Obama administration. And it restructured um, how the Software Freedom Law Center could move around essentially and provide services for open source projects. And in this, they, they, they say this is game changing for them. And that the uh, they have uh, they've been waiting for these developments, and that that gives them and their clients the best of both worlds. That essentially there's a new market that's going to be opening up for the Freedom Law Center. They don't really kind of give any more detail than that. But shortly after that, I think it was on the 27th of September. Um, we have more details, concise and accurate details in this week's Linux Action News. The Law Center sent a trademark. Notice to uh, not not to not to the conservancy, but to like the patent office saying or whatever the trademark office saying we're concerned that there's confusion between the Software Freedom Law Center and the Software Freedom Conservancy. And I agree, there is there is some confusion between the names. It is hard to to keep them straight. That's why I'm trying to say Law Center and Conservancy. Um, and it appeared that perhaps the Law Center was sort of uh, gearing itself up to become more competitive. Then on Friday, November third. Fast forward to Friday, November 3rd, the Software Freedom Conservancy, the, which I believe is probably Karen Sandler and uh, Bradley Kuhn, I think is his last name, probably co-wrote this. I'm not sure, but it's, it's the staff. They have, they have assigned the staff. And they write, a month ago, the Software Freedom Law Center, the, non, the not-for-profit law firm, which launched the conservancy in 2006, took the step of filing a legal action in the United States Patent and Trademark Office seeking cancellation of the Conservancy's trademark for our name, the Software Freedom Conservancy. And they say in here that this is, this is really weird because, you know, we were all, uh, we're, the community has recently all come together and decided that we're all about taking every other approach first before legal action. That's what the Linux kernel enforcement statement was recently about. And they say, yes, we sometimes d disagree publicly about uh, policy issues, but uh, we're both sort of working for the same interests. So they were disappointed that essentially public resources or uh, community resources were being wasted on this action. And it didn't really sound like there was any attempt to work with them. It sounded like on September, oh, September 22nd, that when, when uh, the petition was filed, uh, that the process just started. There was no communication before that is what, is what the impression you would get by reading this. Uh, they say, yesterday we provided an answer that defends the, of the def list of defenses that we plan to use. Now, the element of this that's, that's really something is this post was made during an event that was being held by the law center, the, 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 the people that are filing the petition. That's when this post went live, was during this event. And my understanding is Karen was at that event. She, she was there when this went public. Now, the Conservancy is home to about 46 member projects. And you have to understand that this, is, um, this isn't just membership. This is sort of like a governance, a financial, a financial governance, and copyright governance. Like copyright can be transferred in some cases, and maybe all cases, to the Conservancy. So this is an umbrella organization that is essentially home to some of the intellectual assets for these open source projects. And there's a bunch on their list. Core Boot's on the list. Uh, Debian Copyright Aggression Project, Etherpad hey, is on the list. Jars. That's where a bunch of Clojure yep. projects are hosted. Git is on the list. 
Uh, the GPL compliance project for Linux developers mm-hmm. is on the list. Homebrew, Inkscape. There's a lot on this list. There's, you know, the, it's a for, it's a PHP my admin is on here. Outreachy, QMU, Samba. Samba. Some pretty important projects that this is essentially the home for. This is the this is the legal structure for the copyright holder. Uh, Wine is also on that list. And so it's surprising that the that Elon Moglin's organization, who used to be part of the Free Software Foundation, that ended about a year ago, rather quietly, that his organization, who's funded by the Linux Foundation, would be aggressively going after the conservancy for trademark violation when they helped them set up the organization in the first place. The Law Center helped launch the conservancy in 2006. And they served as the Conservancy's law firm until 2011 and never had any trademark issue during this time. That seems pretty bizarre. That seems pretty bizarre, doesn't it? And people are raising all kinds of conspiracy theories because the Law Center's, one of the Law Center's funders is the Linux Foundation. And one of the Linux Foundation's biggest members is VMware. And one of the companies that the Conservancy is actively going after for GPL violation is VMware. So some people have drawn conspiracies there, although I wouldn't necessarily put any stock in any of that. And I would say we should all definitely wait until way more information comes out. Because this really could come down to personality nuances between the people that run these different organizations. Because on Monday... A rather bizarre post was made by the Software Freedom Law Center by Eben Moglin's organization. And it's hostile. It's it's aggressive. And it's it it feels like unnecessary. Like they would have been better saying nothing. I'll read a few highlights. So the Law Center responds to the blog post made by the Conservancy on Friday. And they write, On Friday, we were while we were putting on our annual conference at Columbia Law School, a puff of near-apocalyptic rhetoric about us was published by the Software Freedom Law Center's former employees, Karen Sandler and Bradley Kuhn, who now manage the Conservancy, which was originally established and wholly funded by the Law Center and still bears our name. We were busy with our conference when this happened, which seems to have been the point. We were glad to have the chance now, after a little much-needed rest, to help everyone avoid unnecessary hyperventilation. And then they go into several different things. They claim that they attempted to make some contact. They say, we've asked intermediaries, friends, business associates, comrades, in the free software movement, other alumni of the Law Center, to stress to Bradley and Karen the importance of opening negotiations. One would, think that this unnes- one would think this was unnecessary with people who talk so frequently about the importance of communication and opening connections with respect to compliance and enforcement. But there, when the shoe is on the other foot, no efforts on our part have gotten us the slightest progress in bringing about discussions to resolve these differences. Friday's response to the Conservancy's management is grossly disproportionate, and in view of their long-maintained refusal to communicate with us, irresponsible. The entire piece and all of the outrage hangs on one thing. And that is supposedly Karen and Bradley always said they were too busy or always too busy. These are direct quotes to have time to talk. Sometimes we were not we sometimes we have not even been offered so much as the courtesy of refusal. But wouldn't wouldn't a law center know that they should probably be talking to the lawyers of the conservancy? Shouldn't it be lawyer to lawyer? Shouldn't they be reaching out to the representation of the conservancy, not to Karen and Bradley directly? Well, I'm not so sure, because if they filed the trademark action, I imagine that would involve the lawyers, right? Like, you don't necessarily have to call the other law firm if you file a petition in court and the court delivers it. But if you're so hell-bent on establishing communication before this action, wouldn't you have tried to reach out to the representation? You would think so, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. What do I know? It's really confusing. I I anal, you know me. Yeah, all right. But uh, this is... um, This is one of these messes that on the surface looks like the law center wants to be in a new market and essentially take over the conservancy's gig, which it felt like it wasn't capable of doing because of rules that, they, as they put, the Obama administration put into place that tied their hands. 
And so it was necessary for them to create these umbrella organizations like the Conservancy out of out of these restrictive IRS rules. And now, now that Trump's in and all these guys are out, new guys are in, these rules are gone. And so we don't need the Conservancy anymore. We don't need them. So let's just have everybody come back over here to Law Center and we'll be your representation. We'll be your copyright holder. We'll be your umbrella organization. We'll be a one-stop shop. Everybody's happy. The only problem is people don't understand it because of the name differences. So let's just get them to change their name so we can compete. It's what it seems like on the surface to some people. And that is dirty because the reality is the conservancy, the Software Freedom Conservancy, should be something that is not subject to the political whims of the United States. When, when, the, when the political, what do they call it, pendulum, yeah. swings to the other side and different people come in running the IRS, then what are we going to do? Uh, then the conservancy will matter. And when you have projects like Wine that have been around for decades, they, they, they're gonna, they don't want to be swung around by the different politics of the U.S. and, and moved around all the right. time. The conservancy offers a stability and a home that is safe and uh, from th that political turmoil. It's part of the whole spirit of the open source projects that we want to support in this thing. And the, you know, the thing is, is like the conservancy, and I, I'm, I, you know, I, I really don't have a dog in this hunt, but just going off of recent news, the conservancy seems to have been working with kernel developers to come up with this enforcement state statement that everybody seems to like. And the, the, the thrust of it was legal action as a last resort, yeah. which having talked to people who write kernel code that's what they want. That's what the people who write the kernel want, is they want legal action as a last resort only to be initiated when other community efforts have failed. That's what people making stuff want. And if, that, and if that's what the conservancy is also agreeing to, then they seem to be representing the wishes of the kernel developers, and that seems to be a good thing in my estimation. It seems to be like the conservancy had recently just made a good move. And then now this whole thing's breaking. It's really, it's really, it's really interesting, um, and I, I don't want to speculate much because I, I think I feel like we've done plenty. I've tried to represent what everybody's different theories are on this while still giving you the base fundamentals of when these things all went down. Yeah, I wouldn't. I if I could give anybody any advice on this story, is don't participate in speculation online. Uh, don't don't stoke these conspiracy fires because this stuff is all going to be an, a long, su so super boring legal process. Huh that will eventually all be played out for us and it'll all be documented what exactly happened. And we don't need to speculate if we're just patient. The information, of it'll eventually just tell the story. The, ter the story will tell itself. And so I encourage all of us to try to tone down the speculation, tone down the rhetoric or the clickbait. In, um, um, what do you call it? Well, you know, if you're, people are going to be incentivized to tweet and blog post and make YouTube videos about this story. And I encourage people not to do it because... It's, it's a nothing story so far. It could literally come down to personality conflicts at the end of the day, and it could represent tearing up tons of open source projects. So There's would a be, lot of better stuff to talk about. Yeah, we, but, but the thing is, we can talk about it, but we can also just wait. It'll all play out in the courts, and everything will be right there in public record for us to review. And we don't have to speculate if we're just patient. So that would be my, would be my advice. I said my piece. I think it's a fascinating story. Yeah, right. I mean, it's certainly important, but like, there's going to be enough bad and maybe good coverage of it. There's going to be plenty of drama and other things that come out of it for better or worse, probably worse. And so, yeah, we've, you know, paid, paid attention, but we don't have to create a whole hype machine. Yeah, in the meantime, I just hope the open source projects that these different organizations represent aren't screwed up with this. I hope, yeah. you know, they're like, their money isn't taking from, from protecting or financing them or running them. I hope that those funds don't have to be like redirected to fight this kind of thing. Like, I hope nothing like that happens. That's what I hope for. And then we just sit back and wait. Uh, but uh, if anybody in the uh, Mumble Room wanted to chime in you, uh, or has any questions, because I know that was a lot to kind of unpack. Again, I'll just make another plug for Linux Action News because we did a much better job just breaking it down concisely and accurately. But um, the uh, development, the response post wasn't out when we recorded Linux Action News. The uh, software, the law center, the Software Freedom Law Center's post was, uh, wasn't posted until Monday. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. You good? You good? Yeah, I'm good. You good? I'm good. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's rough stuff. It's rough stuff. That's why I said we're going to have this really cool app pick at the end of the episode because this thing's not only does it look beautiful, it runs on the terminal, but it helps you kick your Linux box, boss, boxes butt. There, I can, somewhere I can speak, I swear. We're kicking Somehow. butt. That's what matters. Butt is going to be kicked. It's a way to stress test your system. I know uh, we have someone in our Discord room who has a new Oryx on the oh. way. 
And uh, so this will be a great pick for him because he can throw this on his new Oryx and uh, kick the tires and Jelly. see how it goes. And then it, it, I'll just show you. I'll show you. Anyways, so let's let's take a moment and thank Ting for sponsoring the Unplugged program. Go to linux.ting.com, linux.ting.com. $25 off a device or if you bring a device, they'll give you $25 in service credit. Nice. CDMA and GSM Networks. So you can probably bring a device. Just check I'm, a G- their... I'm a GSM guy myself. I, I have been know. for a long time now. But I started out on CDMA. I did too. And there's did nothing too. wrong with that. See, people when they listen are like CDMA, what does it matter with you? Guys, guys, in the Pacific Northwest, we got a lot of trees. So many trees. And CDMA can punch through those trees in a way that GSM just does not seem to. I can't I can't explain it. I'm not a I'm not Neil deGrasse Tyson. I can't explain it. But I can tell you this, you can play around. You just go to linux.ting.com to try it out. You pay for what you use, six dollars a month for the line, and then your usage and Uncle Sam's cut. Whatever that might be in your area. He's got to always give his peace, Wes. But that's why... Well, he's got to pay his ting bill, so... <laughs> you know what I'm saying, though? That's why you got to start with the $6 a month line. Right. Because that's just like... That is at that price level where if I get that on a MiFi and I don't use it much one month, I'm not feeling too guilty about that. And, and the fact that I don't have to worry about how many minutes I may or may not use, I love that. And they got a great dashboard to manage it all. Tons of nice devices you can buy directly. And then the best customer service in the whole industry. Check it out, linux.ting.com. Big thanks to Ting for sponsoring the Unplugged program. All right, so it's Stress Terminal UI. It's kind of a it's kind of a complicated name. So just shorten that to STUI, S-TUI. And it's nice looking. Ooh. Now, uh, I don't want to trigger I don't want to trigger heaven because it, it may be written in Python. I didn't double check before I put it this is. in. I thought so. You install it via pip. I'm sorry, Heaven. I didn't mean to trigger you about that. I didn't realize that, but it is a Python app. But it's a command line Python app, not a GUI Python app. So is that, are you cooler with that? Are we good? He's not talking to me now. You see that? That's how mad he well, is. He's cursing in the background. It's fine. He's so mad he won't yeah. talk to me now. Unbelievable. So the stress terminal UI for your CPU is a great little way to, not only do you get CPU information, but you get uh, temperature and power usage information all visually graphed and represented for you. You display the performance dips that are caused by thermal monitoring. monitoring. Like you can actually see like when thermal, when thermal like limits get hit, you can really see it on this graph, which is really cool for testing laptops. That's why I mentioned the Oryx. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's not something a lot of other tools really highlight. No, you might see it on like something like the XPS 13 or maybe the Galago, but you're, I don't think you're going to see that on the oryx at all you may not see it on other systems too but you can always try and find out and then they have a stress operation mode for really just running the cpu into the ground for as long as possible which i kind of like that too when i'm trying to get a laptop really hot to feel like get a sense of what the fan noise is like um, for a review it's pretty cool and you can also turn off different areas that you don't want to see so if you just want a nice simple display and you have this is the thing that really i think makes it look the best is it has this fancy graph smoothing option and i i just Something about really smooth, fancy graphs on the command line. Graph. On the command line, dude. You know what? I'm all about it. I just can't help it. You start putting pretty graphs like that on a command line, all of a sudden it like, it's like the future meets my childhood, and I, I can't help but love it. So S-T-U-I, and it's available via PIP. And it could be a fun way to uh, kick tires on a VPS, too. It doesn't have to be like a laptop. Oh, well, yeah. Super easy to get going. Here we go. Oh, dude, it looks really good on it there. It does look really nice. That's, I, that's With the window all maximized like that, it looks even better. Purple bars. Mm-mm. I got to say, this is probably one of the, the slickest looking end curses mm-hmm. yeah. eyes I've ever seen. I'm going to mm-hmm. have to take a look at, the, look at the source there. Yeah, they've done a really impressive job. That was actually what originally drew it to me. And then I was like, gosh, I always am looking for ways. I have like a, I have like a little toolbox now. Of, of ways that I abuse review systems that are just like torture chamber tools. Well, really. you want to know. You, you know, I you do. only have a short time with the system. I um, do. And I should give a I should give a plug to the Open Benchmark site and uh, the Pharonix test suite because isn't that just the funniest thing? You open that up and you go to the game section and sure enough, if he's not keeping that thing pretty update to like most recent games, it has whole automated scripts where it'll download it from Steam and install it on your system <laughs> and then play the game for a little bit and benchmark the whole damn thing like... Jeez, Louise! If there isn't just an incredible, incredible amount of work into that Pharonix test suite, yeah, if you that's want. true. That's another way to bang on your system a little bit. But this is just a nice, quick way. You could just load this if you got Python already on your system, and uh, it'd be easy to do it on a VPS too. Oh yeah, which I like that. So, and it just looks so good. I, I should uh, kind of a weird name, S two E. I should put it on my uh, yeah. I should put it on my uh, X to go system and just uh, keep it going for a while and see how that does. 
see how it see how it performs. Oh boy, that does seem like a nice way to like maybe benchmark some different VPSs and mm-hmm. other things. Mm-hmm. Maybe mm-hmm. it's just like a, a, a backwards Family Guy reference, and it's just Stewie. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. Just think terminal of, user interface. Yeah, but Stu, I do like Stewie. That's a that's a good way to. Sounds think like about a it. user interface designed to stress the user. Yeah, which yeah. Uh, that we've already have that perfected. So I think uh, we're looking at the recording right now. Um, yeah, huh. we're definitely so we're trying to come up with a way to do the Gen Two challenge. We're gonna we're gonna really try to get it in the show. We are gonna get. We're it gonna in try the show. to get to this. We're gonna try to get this in the show. It's gonna take forever, man. <laughs> so, but we have we have an approach we're working on. I don't think we've totally nailed it down yet. We were discussing the pre-show. So, if you joined us live, you kind of heard what our current thoughts are. And so, after the show, Wes and I are gonna compare notes and see which way we think would be the best to pull it off. And then we have well, hopefully by next week's episode, we'll have our game plan for the Gen Two. I'm excited. But I think. What we should plan for for the focus of next week. So it's not going to be the Gen 2 review, but we're going to tell you our plan for the Gen 2 review next week. See what we're doing here. We're so I'm clever. sorry. I'm sorry. I don't. I, you know what? What happened was. Is Listen, that, we'll call this a stage zero install. Oh, yeah, oh. that's right. Here's the thing is uh, this like New York thing happened and then like this Ubuntu 1710 thing happened. And then next Tuesday, uh, Fedora 27 lands. So I feel like we're going to have to talk about Fedora. That's next week. Next week's episode, we got to talk Fedora 27. So I'm going to be installing that to give that a go back onto GNOME for one week. I don't know what system I want to take off of Unity, though. I got to go through that whole thing now. Oh. It's going to be rough. It's going to be so rough. You're going to hate it. So if you get a chance, Wes, uh, install Fedora 27 in the next few days. Yeah, all right. We'll kick the tires a little bit. Heck we'll yeah. talk about it on uh, I always love episode. installing a new Fedora release. And that invite extends to uh, the uh, the virtual lug and those of you listening on your own. If you want to check out Fedora 27 before episode 223, kick the tires with us, and then uh, we'll all come back and compare notes and talk about it or listen along. It would be like a co-review. You like that? I like that a lot. So we have a Discord room dedicated to this show now. You can go to discord.me slash jupitercolony for the main link to the server. And then once you get in there, look for the Linux Unplugged channel. And I'm mentioning this because we're using this during our live shows. So even if you can't make it live, you can still go back after the show and see some of the stuff people talked about, some of the links people shared, and, you know, maybe meet new community members too that might still be there. It's like a live archive. Yeah, yeah. So it's uh, kind of a cool way if you see something go by the video that you want or if you just want to check it in, if you listen to the audio version, you're like, I want to just go see what the, what the Discord room is talking about, you can go over there. We, stu- we do still have that mumble room. We're still doing mumble for the audio. That's where our virtual lug still at is on our mumble server. So still totally looking for people to join us there Please, every single week. Please, yeah. yeah. All right, guys, is there anything else we want to include in this week's episode? I don't think so. Well, very good. Where should people find you throughout the week, Mr. Wes? At West Bain. You crazy SOB. Also, me. also check him out on the TechSnap program. Oh, what about do. What about you, Beardsley? Rectodonet. There you go. Nice and simple. Easy peasy. Find me tomorrow on the Unfilter Show. Going to be a huge oh, gosh. show. Huge, huge you better, show. You better be preparing right now. And then uh, I'm going to share a little rust shenanigans. A little rust. A little rust shenanigans in user error. So check out user error this week if you're curious about that. And it's a lot of fun. Otherwise, just... Grab our live time over on our calendar page and then join us next week if you can. Otherwise, grab the feed and we'll see you then. I think it's wasted effort. Who All right. snuck him in there? Let's uh, let's figure out this tile. We got to get this thing figured out. Oh gosh, we do. Come on now, we got to get this. Let's get this thing printed out. Let's get out of here. It's gonna be dark here in just any minute. Come on now. Come on now. Let's go. Let's go. JBTitles.com. JB Gen two unplugged. Still compiling. Done. Winner. Perfect. Fine. Now you're gonna hit up America compiling Gen two. Winner. Winner. Chicken dinner. Winner. Winner. Chicken dinner. Hmm. Ed is all you need. Nice. Nice. Dude, where's my C? The division inside open source. A community divided.
I like that. <laughs> Token, Token Ring. Ring's been killing it he's, with the titles. He's today. getting deep, is what he's doing. He's reaching deep into his emotions, and he's coming out with these uh, real winners. Uh, all right. So I do want to do a Windows Unplugged. I'm not going to lie. We could do it. Conserving Rust. <laughs> oh, I was hoping we could just bang this out real quick. I thought I this would be a quick one. I thought, okay, this is the week. We're just going to be. So I thought we came in with a lot of energy. We'd get it, but I, that didn't work. That has already backfired. I can tell. I can already yeah, tell. I'm burnt out. Ugh. Yeah, yeah. We're tapped out. Yep. We're tapped out. Well, you, know, you and I need to go on a sabbatical uh, for five years oh, and then gosh, come back and yeah. do one episode, do just one really good episode, and then retire. Right? I'm in. I'm in. Yeah. It's done. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think it works. Maybe like I'll that. buy uh, my own Lady Jubes. Yeah, there you go. We'll go caravanning. Yeah, caravan. <laughs> Actually, the dream would be to caravan and still podcast. That oh, would really, that yeah. would be a lot of fun. Just, uh, we'll just uh, do road shows the whole time. That sounds we'll Go around and do uh, Linux meetups. Either great or entirely exhausting. <laughs> yeah. It'd be both of those things.